Hey guys, this video is on intermolecular forces. Um, we're going to look at three different types. Um, called one, One's called dispersion forces. You will also see them called London forces, Van der Waals forces, or maybe even London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole um, forces, and hydrogen bonding. Starting with dispersion forces, um, we're going in order of weakest to strongest. Um, dispersion, dispersion forces are the weakest of these three on a one-to-one -one basis, um, but they can add up, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. Every molecule has dispersion forces. Every atom has dispersion forces. Um, dispersion forces are present whenever there are electrons present. Um, <clears throat> and the more electrons there are, the greater the strength of the dispersion forces. Um, so the way that dispersion forces come about is um, we have to think about the electron cloud um, in a molecule or an atom as being um, something that's not static, and, and it isn't. It's moving around all the time. It's shifting all the time. The, the electron density shifts around um, constantly. And so at any given instant, at some point, there's likely to be some region of electron density that's denser in a molecule than another region meaning that there's a slight negative charge in the more dense region, slight positive charge in the less dense region. And then it changes instantaneously, you know, it's just moving about all the time. Um, but what happens is if, when two molecules come close to each other, um, they influence each other's um, <clears throat> um, shifting of this electron density, the charge distribution. Um, they create what's called an instantaneous dipole. So if, um, like say, just atoms, like so xenon or something, right? So we have this one atom over here um, that's move all by itself, moving around, um, and its charges are going to be, you know, maybe the negative charge will be up here, positive charge over here, but then as it moves closer to this other atom, this positive, um, and let's say at the, at the instant that they get close to each other, the positive charge on this atom over here is right here. So as this atom gets close, the positive charge here on this atom is going to attract the, the, um, the electron density, the electron cloud on this atom, creating a, um, a temporary negative charge right there, right next to this positive charge on this atom. And so we, we, what we have is we have a positive region and a negative region right next to each other. That's an attractive interaction. That's, what, um, that's called an induced dipole sometimes. Um, so um, this is what this induced dipole, this molecule, there is this atom induced a dipole in this molecule and the opposite charges are holding each other together. Um, and then it shifts and they, they fly away. But it is an attractive force um, and it is an intermolecular force. So you'll notice that what we're talking about here is the force between different species, two molecules or two atoms that are not attached to each other. That's as opposed to intramolecular forces. Intramolecular forces we, we already talked about. Those are bonds, ionic bonds or covalent bonds. This is another, the next level out. Um, and the reason we're talking about this is this, the strength of the intermolecular forces um, between molecules or atoms um, influences their behavior, um, causes them to be a solid liquid or a gas at a given temperature and pressure, for example. Um, so, um, <clears throat> The, the more electrons there are, the greater the, um, the strength of the dispersion forces because the more electrons there are, the more what we say polarizable that molecule is. It's more easy to be, it's easier, <laughs> more easy, it's easier to be polarized. It's, it's um, an analogy, if you would, if you imagine a water balloon, a really, really big balloon filled with water. That's really sloshy, right? Polarizability just means sloshiness. Um, the bigger that balloon, the sloshier that the water inside of it is, and the water is analogous to the electron density. So a large atom or molecule with a lot of electrons is very sloshy, very polarizable. It's easy to create larger regions of positive, more positive and more negative charge. Whereas in a really, really small water balloon, it's not very sloshy. So in a small atom or molecule, um, with not many very electrons, it's not very polarizable. And that means that the size of the positive and negative charges that are induced are smaller, and so the strength of the dispersion forces is smaller. Um, and so a good shortcut for more electrons is molar mass, because the higher the molar mass, the higher the number of electrons in that molecule atom. Um, so that's, a, that's a good shortcut to remember right there, guys. Um, the next thing that infer, in, um, influences the... Um, 
the strength of the intermolecular forces when we're talking about dispersion forces is the shape of the molecule. Um, a round molecule has less surface area um, than a, um, for example, cylindrical molecule. So if you look at these, these are supposed to represent two different molecules over here. And because they're cylindrical, um, as they come up next to each other, they have more surface area to interact and they can create more regions of induced dipole. And more regions there are, the, the, the greater the overall strength of that intermolecular force. Um, these forces are, are summative, they, they add up. Um, so if we have two molecules that are about the same molecular weight, but one is cylindrical and one is spherical, the one with um, the cylindrical shape will have greater, um, the greater strength of the intermolecular forces. Now, we're going to talk about um, properties of liquids um, and solids um, a little bit later in this chapter, but one of the things that um, intermolecular forces influence is the boiling point of a uh, liquid. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point because um, the stronger the intermolecular forces are, um, the more strongly those molecules in the liquid phase are, are held to each other and the more energy we have to put in to pull them apart to create a gas. Um, so high, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point and vice versa. The weaker the intermolecular forces, the lower the boiling point. So for example, um, which of these, the carbon tetrafluoride or the carbon tetrachloride, do you think has the highest boiling point? Which of these two, um, this is called n-pentane or terbutyl, um, has a higher boiling point? Um, so why don't you guys figure it out, and when you get an answer, come on back. Welcome back. Well, um, between these two right here, these are both, um, neither one of these, um, they, all have, they have the same shape. They're both tetrahedral, if you draw out the Lewis structure and use Vesper theory. They're both tetrahedral, so the same shape, which is basically um, what we're talking about here in terms of intermolecular forces. A tetrahedral geometry from the outside basically looks like a sphere. Okay? Um, but the only difference is one of these has four fluorines and one of them has four chlorines. Chlorines are, have higher molar mass and thus more electrons than fluorines, so this molecule here will have more electrons be more polarizable and have higher um, or stronger dispersion forces and thus a higher boiling point. So carbon tetrachloride is the answer here. These two guys down here, they have the same exact formula, C5H12, five carbons, 12 hydrogens, but they're different shapes. Um, they're what are called geometric isomers of each other. Um, this one right here, um, it's this, remember the, um, the, this is giving you basically the order of attachment. These five carbons are basically in a chain with hydrogens on the outside. So it's basically, if you look at this from the outside, a sphere, uh, excuse me, a cylinder. Whereas this one, this is a carbon with four methyl groups, CH3 is around it. This is basically a big sphere because this has less surface area than this does. This one here, we predict would have a higher boiling point. As a matter of fact, at room temperature, this is a liquid and this is a gas. The next intermolecular force, dipole-dipole forces. So these are stronger than dispersion forces, but they only exist in molecules that are polar. Um, um, and the greater the, 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 okay, so let's talk about dipole moments. So hy hydrogen chloride, this is a gas, so it's not hydrochloric acid. Um, chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0, hydrogen is 2.1. The difference is 0.9, so this is a polar bond. And because there's only two atoms, that means it's a polar molecule. Because chlorine is more electronegative, the electron density is going to be greater over on its side than on the hydrogen side. So um, remember, this is an electrostatic potential map. The red means um, negative and the blue means positive. Um, so we have more negative charge here, more positive charge here. Just like in those um, dispersion forces, but the difference is these are permanent and the size of the charges is greater. So the strength of the interaction, which comes about basically the same way, opposite charges attract each other. So the negative charge in this molecule attracts the positive charge in this molecule. But because they're permanent and larger in magnitude, the strength of this interaction is stronger than dispersion forces. So if you have a molecule that has dispersion forces only and a molecule that has dipole-dipole forces, usually the one with dipole-dipole forces is going to have a higher boiling point and other properties that we're going to talk about later. 
um, the greater the dipole moment, the stronger the dipole, dipole force is. So when we say dipole moment, basically we're talking about um, how big the charge is and how far apart the two um, atoms are from each other. The greater, the farther apart they are, the greater the, the charge. Um, th so basically the greater the difference in electronegativity and the bigger they are, the greater the um, dipole moment and the stronger the dipole, dipole forces are for that molecule with each other. Um, so remember, um, this is a review back um, when we did Vesper theory and all that, but um, how to tell if a molecule is polar because you're going to have to do that now still. Um, remember, um, a bond is polar if the difference in electronegativity is bigger than 0.4. Remember, we memorized some, and the, you know, we also have the trend in the periodic table. Um, in a molecule, each of the bonds act as a dipole, di as a dipole a separation of charge. And if the dipoles all cancel out, or if, there, or if there are no polar bonds, then the molecule is nonpolar. But if they don't cancel out, the molecule is polar. So, you know, to figure out if a molecule is polar, unless it's a really simple molecule, you should draw the Lewis structure, um, get the shape, and look at the difference in polarities. So which of these do you think has the higher boiling point? Carbon tetrafluoride or foromethane? Um, foromethane or chloromethane? Um, go ahead and see if you can figure this out, and when you um, get an answer, come on back. Welcome back. Well, um, between these two, this one is going to be non-polar. It's tetrahedral, everything cancels. This is polar, it doesn't cancel. So this one has dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. This doesn't. This only has dispersion forces. So this one, for methane, will have a higher boiling point. Comparing these two, they're both polar. Um, but the this chlorine atom is, is larger than the fluorine. So the bond here between the chlorine and the carbon is going to be longer. The... Um, the dipole moment will actually be larger, and this, this one here will have a higher boiling point. So the last intermolecular force we're going to talk about is hydrogen bonding. First thing is, hydrogen bonding is not a bond. It's an intermolecular force. It's a horrible name. Okay, So hydrogen bonding is um, an intermolecular force, um, and it only exists to any appreciable amount in molecules that have a hydrogen atom that's directly, has to be directly bonded to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atom. So not only does it have to have hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, but that hydrogen must be directly attached to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. For example, water. Um, H2O has two hydrogens directly attached to an oxygen. It exhibits hydrogen bonding between water molecules. Now hydrogen bonding, guys, is the strongest of these three intermolecular forces. Um, it, it causes water to, to freeze at the, the temperature that it does, for example. Um, now, it's the way that hydrogen bonding occurs is because nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, um, all three of those, first of all, are the three most electronegative elements in the periodic table. So the hydrogen that's directly attached to them, um, the electrons in that bond are pulled very strongly towards the nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Two, um, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine almost always have one or more lone pairs of electrons on them. Um, and that's going to be important too. So what happens is the really electronegative nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine pulls the electrons very strongly away from the hydrogen. So like this hydrogen right here, it has the electron, it ha only comes with one electron, hydrogen has one electron, and it's in this bond, and it's being pulled away from it. So this is basically an exposed nucleus, a very concentrated positive charge. That has a very strong attraction for negative charge, and look what we have right here next to it. We have lone pairs of electrons that are not held very strongly. They're kind of loosely attached there. It's easy to pull the, the electron cloud from these lone pairs over towards this possibly charged hydrogen, um, make, creating a, a pretty strong intermolecular force. Um, and um, anytime you have and again, hydrogen directly attached to nitrogen and oxygen performing, this is going to happen and you'll have hydrogen bonding. Now, a molecule can be a hydrogen bond acceptor without being a hydrogen bond donor. For example, dimethyl ether, this molecule right here, it does not have a hydrogen directly attached to its oxygen, but if you put another molecule, like say water, in with it, mix it in, um, the hydrogen on the water molecule um, can interact with this oxygen in the same way that it can with an oxygen on another water molecule, creating a hydrogen bond between them, the dimethyl ether and the water. So, 
Which of these do you think exhibit hydrogen bonding? When you get an answer, come on back. Welcome back. Well, that while this has fluorine, it does not have a hydrogen anywhere, so no hydrogen bonding here. Um, this is acetic acid, and if you draw out the Lewis structure, you'll see that this hydrogen is attached to one of these oxygens, so yes, this has hydrogen bonding. This is fluoromethane. Um, it has a fluorine and has hydrogens, but the for, the hydro, none of the hydrogens are attached to the fluorine. The three hydrogens are on the carbon, the fluorine's on the carbon, no hydrogen bonding. So the only one of these that exhibits hydrogen bonding is acetic acid. And that's all there is to it, guys.